I am here today with cardiologist Dr. Jack Wolfson. He's a board-certified cardiologist who uses nutrition and supplements to prevent and treat diseases. After 10 years performing angiograms, pacemakers, and other cardiac procedures, Dr. Wolfson started the drswolfson.com in 2012 to offer people the ultimate and holistic heart health care and a different path than the standard cardiology pills and procedures. Dr. Wolfson is married to a chiropractor, Dr. Heather Wolfson, and they are the Doctors Wolfson. Their website, drswolfson.com. It's a great resource for holistic health, and they have two beautiful young babies, uh, uh, actually boys, and a new baby. Actually, the last time I, I saw you, Dr. Wolfson, uh, I think your wife may have been carrying at that point. And uh, and you've got to check out Dr. Wolfson's book. The Paleo Cardiologist, Dr. Wolfson. Thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, uh, Dr. Osborne, it's an absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, last time we saw you in person was at the Truth About Cancer down in Orlando, and my wife was definitely uh, uh, busting at the seams, and uh, she was looking phenomenal as always. Unfortunately, I had to travel, so she, uh, you know, at, on, on the night of the big gala, and she was all decked out in this beautiful dress. Took a nice picture with my buddy, our buddy uh, Billy Demoss. Uh, uh, at that dinner and a fantastic event but it's a pleasure to be on and it's so important for you know for doctors like us to get that message out there uh, certainly the cardiovascular disease uh, you know is, is something that's preventable and treatable and reversible and we don't need to do it with drugs well tell us a little bit about that I mean one of the things that I, I have tried to do is really bring clinicians to the table to really share their experiences. Can you talk a little bit about what you got you going into a more natural direction? Because you know, classic cardiology is 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 pretty aggressive in the opposite direction. Yeah, most certainly. You know, I spent uh, uh, ten years in medical training, and four years of medical school, three years of internal medicine, three years of cardiology, and then I was a couple years on the job and just seeing, you know, just. Uh, you know, uh, thousands, you know, of patients, uh, you know, on a weekly basis, monthly basis, just so many patients, the sickest of the sick. And uh, I was certainly getting frustrated at that point because the hospital is like a revolving door. You know, patients come in, have a heart attack, you tune them up, you send them back out, and then a few months later they come back in with another heart attack or a pharmaceutical complication or congestive heart failure or a stroke, you name it. And I was starting to get frustrated, but more importantly, I saw the illness of my father. And my father was a cardiologist, and I was following exactly in his footsteps. And eventually, he gets diagnosed with a Parkinson's-like disease. And the doctors at the Mayo Clinic have no idea why he has this Parkinson's-like disease in diagnosis. They have no idea why. They have no therapy for him, and they said he'll be dead within three years. And my father died a tortuous death within three years. But then I meet this chiropractor, Dr. Heather, and Dr. Heather says that uh, uh, she tells me exactly why my father was sick. <laughs> she tells me all the reasons why he's sick. And, you know, it really just made a you know, huge impact in my, in my personal life, in my family, and, uh, and, and, and certainly in my work. So, uh, you know, that's where I practice now. Eventually, I left a big, big, big cardiology group making big-time cardiology money, started up our own practice in 2012, and now it gets me on with, uh, with guys like you for, for such an important uh, uh, topic. But it's, it's just amazing that, um, that, you were, that you were brave enough to make that transition. I know there's a lot of pressure in, in medicine in general for any doctors to deviate, and so thank you for, for having the courage to, to join the dark side, so to speak. Um, well, you know, I mean, a, a lot of people, you know, yeah, exactly, you said courage and bravery, and I do appreciate that, because a lot of people said a little more uh, uh, condemning comments about me as far as uh, he was nuts, he fell in love, you know, with this chiropractor, he was a great cardiologist, but he fell in love with this chiropractor and went off the deep end, you know, so people certainly said a lot of negative things about me, but uh, but that's okay, you know, we got a lot of friends in this space, and, and I think really people are wising up, uh, to, you know, and, and they want to find out the cause of why they're sick, they don't want just pills and dangerous dangerous procedures. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, well, let's dive in. So, in cardiology, you know, we have we have heart diseases is goes back and forth between cancer and heart disease is the top killer in the United States. But I wanted to dive in and, and get your take on how many different conditions that are diagnosed as heart disease are actually forms of autoimmune disease because this is a topic not many people are aware of. Can you talk us through that? 
Yeah, most certainly. You know, we go through medical uh, schooling and, and, you know, residency. Uh, you know, we learn about autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, systemic lupus erythematosus, and then, of course, some strange oddball ones like Church Strauss and, um, uh, you know, Wegner's granulomatosis and uh, Reiter's syndrome and all these strange things. And, in fact, I did a rotation at the Cleveland Clinic in 1995, and that's their specialty is on all those, you know, rare oddball you know, diagnoses. And, uh, um, but then you come to realize the more you learn, the more you study, the more the literature, you know, supports it is that, uh, uh, coronary artery disease is autoimmune. Hypertension is autoimmune. Um, uh, atrial fibrillation, which affects just millions and millions of people and is just damaging so many lives for a variety of reasons. First off, the actual uh, uh, illness, and second of all, of course, the pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, and, and to realize that that's autoimmune, it was really fundamental to me and real awakening to me uh, to realize that, and I'm excited to share that message in my book and, and on the uh, you know, autoimmune revolution. So talk us through, so you mentioned that some of these medications, you know, in particular you said for AFib, but... Um, can you talk us uh, talk through what some of these medications can actually do? Because I'm sure there are a lot of people listening to this conversation that maybe they have a diagnosis of AFib or high blood pressure, hypertension, and they're on calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, or diuretics. Can you talk us through some of those side effects and what those medications can actually do and how they can hinder a person from actually getting better? Well, you know, the, the side effects, you know, are possible in, in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, the classical side effects of any of those blood pressure drugs are going to be fatigue. Uh, they can be constipation. They can be memory loss. Uh, uh, you know, a whole different variety of symptoms, you know, that are there, you know, but fundamentally the, the pharmaceuticals are just cover-ups. They're just band-aids. You know, people are not deficient in pharmaceuticals. You know, the hypertensive patient, there's a reason for the hypertension there's a, uh, you know, and it's not, uh, you know, blood pressure drug deficiencies. And that's what we really want to highlight to people to get that information out there that go after the cause and, and the cause of why people get sick. And that's what my wife, you know, really, uh, you know, came to the table with, you know, and me, and she's like, you know, your pills are killing people, your procedures are killing people, you know, you're in the sickness paradigm, you know, medicine is worthless, and and that was all on our, on our, on our first date, you know, Dr. Peter, so, uh, <laughs> you know, she really, you know, hit me over the head with a sledgehammer, um, you know, right, right from the get-go, and, uh, you know, so now in my practice, I, I work to get people off of pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, and, and once again, to identify that cause. Let's let's talk a little bit then about leaky heart. You know, everybody's talking about leaky gut. We've heard some talk about leaky brain. Can we talk a little bit about leaky heart? Because this leaky barrier is one of the one of the big fundamentals in autoimmunity. Yeah, it sure is. You know, when my wife first mentioned uh, you know, the concept of leaky gut back when we first met, I kinda like laughed in her face. I'm like, Where do you get this bogus diagnosis leaky gut? And uh, <laughs> she said, uh, well, you know what, uh, I'm not going to take my time right now. Go read about it. So I, I try and go read about it, and there's not much in the medical literature. And I meet some natural doctors, and what they have to say makes sense. Well, over the last 10 years, the medical literature has exploded on the idea of uh, uh, leaky gut and intestinal hyperpermeability. And over the last couple of years, you can actually... Uh, test for it. And I, and I love doing the testing. You know, there, there's some fantastic doctors that are out there and they heal with their hands. Uh, I, I like to do the blood test. I like to see what that shows. And, you know, there's there's companies that are doing leaky gut assessments. Uh, you know, my, my uh, company of choice is Vibrant America, but there's, um, uh, you know, Cyrex Labs. There's other companies that are out there that do the leaky gut testing. And I would just implore people, hey, just get tested. So, but back to your question, we've, we've heard so much about leaky gut on the summit, and that's all great because that's fundamental, but leaky gut will lead to leaky heart. So if you have a leaky epithelial barrier of the cells that lie in the intestines, it leads to a leaky endothelial layer of the blood vessels of the arteries, and in particular, coronary arteries. So once we identify that, you know, leaky gut can lead to leaky heart and leaky gut can lead to leaky brain, we understand that, yeah, it's all these barriers that are leaky and we better fix them or we're going to suffer the end result. And the end result is, of course, symptomatic disease. What you mentioned the testing for, you know, for leaky gut. What are some of the types of tests that you'll look at in people that have, you know, heart disease, coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, 
Are you looking at nutritional deficiencies? What are you kind of looking at if somebody comes to see Dr. Wolfson at the practice and they're trying to get off their medications? Is there is there kind of a, a protocol that you follow to say, I want to know these certain things and I want to test for these certain things? Because I, like you, I think I'm a big test guy. I, I like to test before guessing. And uh, I, th- yeah. I think science can rule out a lot of uh, a lot of subjectivity. So can you walk us through what a new a new person coming to see you, a patient coming to see you might might get looked at? Yeah, most certainly, and I appreciate the uh, uh, promotion for my for my office based practice uh, in, in that sense. But no, in, in all seriousness, whoever your holistic doctor is, you know, when people come to see me, there's three fundamental tests I like to order. I like to order um, uh, the most advanced cardiovascular analysis on the planet, so advanced lipids, advanced markers of inflammation, oxidative stress, vitamin D, omega threes. Um, uh, uh, CoQ10 levels, advanced thyroid, uh, advanced you know blood sugar, homocysteine, all those things are all all critical. And then of course I want to do a micronutrient assessment. And typically I use Vibrant Micronutrient for that, which is available on our website. But I also uh, you know use some Genova Diagnostics as well. Um, but I love the Vibrant Micronutrient test because uh, yeah I know you're familiar with the company. They are testing for vitamin K1 and K2 inside the or outside of the cell in the serum and also intracellular K2 and I really think that that testing is just uh, you know holy grail type stuff where if you can determine that somebody is not getting enough K2 inside of the cells they will never reverse coronary disease but you will reverse it if you can really crank up levels of intracellular K2 and then also the, the third test they order on everybody is that vibrant uh, wheat tumor. And the wheat tumor is two components. One is like 50 different antibodies to, uh, uh, to, uh, um, uh, gliadin, or to uh, gliadin, gluten, uh, uh, the gluten molecule, the non-gluten components of wheat, but also that intestinal permeability. And the intestinal permeability panel includes zonulin, uh, antibodies to zonulin, antibodies to actin, and antibodies to lipopolysaccharides. And once you arm yourself with that information and you get on the plan and then you repeat the test three months later, you're on your way back to uh, to total body health and wellness. So so you're seeing turnarounds with, with good information. You're seeing turnarounds that, that occur three Three months, six months later. Now, when you say turnaround, are you saying you know they're back on the road, or are you saying are you seeing reversal of of uh, of heart disease as a whole? Well, here's the problem with with actually looking for a reversal is that you know there are some cardiologists that even call themselves holistic cardiologists that they do CT scanning on people, so they do coronary CT scans looking for disease at time zero and then repeat the test sometime down the road. I'm totally against that. I'm anti-radiation. My father died of a radiation-based disease on top of everything else that caused it. I, myself as a cardiologist doing all those pacemakers and angiograms, I was blasted with radiation. Radiation causes heart disease, causes cancer, causes brain disease. There's no role for it in the diagnosis and prevention of coronary artery disease. So that being said, how do we know that we're actually making a difference? Uh, you know, the reality is, is that I've got a, you know, a bunch of clinical stories you know, that I could tell you know, about people that did wind up going for a repeat angiogram or did wind up going for a repeat CT scan, none of which I ordered, but they happened to, and there were positive changes in, in probably 75% of the cases. So, uh, you know, so that being said, I, I rely on the blood test. And if the blood tests show me that the lipids look good, the inflammation looks good, the, the gut barrier looks good, and all these other factors that we test, once we've, once we've you know, really improved on all those, I think that's the best strategy to preventing the progression and, more importantly, preventing plaque rupture. What are, you, what are your thoughts on, you know, the paleo diet? You wrote a book, The Paleo Cardiologist. You know, what, what got you into the paleo diet? And because there's so many people that are out there, and there are actually other cardiologists on the other side of the, on the, other side of the fence that, that talk about, you know, vegetarian or vegan-based diets as being a better alternative for, for heart disease. Can you kind of talk about the, the kind of the polar opposites of vegetarianism versus like a paleo diet, which is much richer in meat, and your experience with cardiovascular disease? Yeah, most certainly. And I know some of those other cardiologists. I know I know them very well. It's totally flawed because they're uh, pseudo-demented because they're missing uh, fish-based omega-3s. But uh, you know, the, the, in all seriousness, you know, Doc, is that our ancestors have been eating a certain way for millions of years. 
that's all there is to it. They eat tons of vegetables, they eat free-range grass-fed meats, and they certainly eat wild seafood. And I think when you are in congruence with Mother Nature, and you're getting the sunshine, and you're getting appropriate sleep and physical activity, all these things are what really matters, you know, to total body health and wellness. But the people that preach the, you know, the veganism, uh, I think that it's totally faulty. I think it is malpractice. I think it is a starvation deficiency diet, and uh, and, and they're just wrong. The optimal diet is just our evolutionary diet. Every society in the history of the world has been a meat and or seafood eater. They ate quality meats and seafood, and that's certainly what I recommend. But I would ask you, Doc, I mean, like, why can't a vegan eat an oyster? Like, I mean, like, what, what does it matter with an oyster that makes it any more dangerous than a head of cabbage, you know, or, or chlorella spirulina? Oh, well, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, shellfish, you know, uh, uh, are high in are high in toxins. Well, what do you think chlorella and algae do? I mean, they're they're purifiers of the waters too. You know, so uh, you know, in short, when I went through medical school, actually, I was a cardiology fellow, and I heard a debate between uh, the late Robert Atkins of of low carb fame and Dean Ornish of low fat fame, and I walked out of that debate and I said, I am a low carb guy. Yeah, yeah, I I, I tend to err on that side. I mean, I in my experience, I see so many vegans that come to me that are malnourished and they have, you know, whether they have amino acid deficits or or vitamin B12 iron and zinc deficiencies. And of course, these are critical, critical nutrients for heart health. And, uh, and I just see it on a regular basis. So uh, I think many people go, go ahead. No, I'm sorry to interrupt. I mean, but you know, plus the omega threes, I mean, you cannot get omega-3s from eating walnuts or chia seeds uh, or anything else. Eating omega-3s, EPA, DHA, only comes from the sea. And the vegans that you test, that I test, they are woefully deficient. And the people with the highest levels of omega-3, uh, you know, as, as EPA, DHA, are the healthiest people on the planet and live the longest. So, uh, you know, if, if you're a vegan out there, please consider eating uh, wild seafood. Yeah, I would, I would, I would tend to agree with that. Um, let's 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 switch gears a little bit here. So we've talked about lab testing and what you, and what you like to do and kind of the follow up. We've talked about paleo versus kind of a plant based diet. I want to go backward a little bit because we were talking earlier about I, I asked you about side effects of some of the medications, but I want to ask you a little bit different of a question. One of the one of the biggest drugs that's given to people that have an increased or a perceived increased risk of heart disease in cardiology today is the statins. Can you talk a little bit to our audience about statins and what they do and and how they might have an, a negative impact on heart disease overall? Yeah, most certainly. Listen, statins uh, are, are inhibitors of the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme. And that enzyme is a fundamental uh, factor that takes food and turns it into other good stuff that we need. And things like CoQ10, things like cholesterol, things like our hormones, things like Dolacol, which is present in the substantia nigra of the brain. And if you're not making Dolacol, you don't put it into your substantia nigra of your brain and then you wind up with a Parkinson's like illness. So uh, you know, you know it, quite simply, you know, the statin drug is a major problem. Forty percent reduction in CoQ10 levels, according to the Journal of, Int- uh, of Internal Medicine, uh, you know, from just a few years ago. And the answer is not to take CoQ supplements with statins. The answer is not to take statins. There's just there's better ways to reduce your cardiovascular risk. And you know, I've done. I, I have a whole chapter on this, but I've also done blog posts, you know, why statin drugs are killing millions of people. And I believe that because all these people have a false sense of security, so they continue to eat like garbage. But number two is that the the statin drugs, according to their data, reduces your risk of having a heart attack, stroke, and dying from 6% to 5%. Well, that's not good enough for me, my family, my patients. I don't want 6% or 5%. I want them at 0%. And we know their side fails to do that. We know their data. I believe on our side, when you live with in congruence with Mother Nature and our ancestral wisdom, that's how you're going to get the best results and get down to that 0% risk. But statin drugs, I've seen every side effect, Dr. Peter. I've seen everything from muscle failure. I've seen 
I've seen uh, uh, kidney failure. I've seen liver failure. Uh, you know, I've seen transient global amnesia. I've seen cognitive, cognitive defects. I've seen just about everything. You know, fatigue, low testosterone. You name it, it can be caused from statin drugs, and there's just a better way. You know, in your opinion, on that note, you mentioned low testosterone. It, you know, do you feel like a lot of these low testosterone centers that are popping up across the country are in large part as a result of the overprescriptive use of statin medications? I, I think I think it's a lot of factors, but certainly you know the overdose on statins you know is one of them. I mean, according to the literature that's been published, uh, you know there's plenty of case reports on testosterone uh, deficiencies related to statin drugs. But overall, you know, in randomized trials, um, it, it doesn't really appear that it's a major factor. But to the individual person, it certainly can be. And I think if you do have low testosterone and you're on statin drugs, the first thing you do, need to do is not get a prescription for testosterone. It's to work to get off. The statin drug, and uh, you know, and 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 really, I'm not a, I'm not opposed to testosterone therapy when it's necessary, but you have to maximize everything else first. And then, if your T is still low and you're symptomatic, then you may be a candidate. But obviously, all these uh, you know different uh, you know doc in the box uh, you know centers you know for uh, men with issues you know they're, they're willing to prescribe testosterone. It's all a cover up, and it's all uh, it's all dangerous you know, as far as I'm concerned because when it's not monitored appropriately, uh, high testosterone leads to high estrogen, and then a man, that's a recipe for cardiovascular uh, heart attack, stroke, and, and dying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what, what? let's go back again. We, we talked a little bit about the statin medications, and you mentioned you mentioned a number of the different side effects. Would, would you say that you see a lot of people start to develop muscle loss, muscle weakness, inability to exercise as a result of being on statins as well? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, once, once again, you're interfering with the structural mechanisms of the body. You're interfering with CoQ10 production, and the pharmaceutical companies don't think that's a big deal, apparently. CoQ10 is a necessary critical cofactor in the production of energy, ATP, at the mitochondrial level. And if you're not producing uh, ATP, well, you know, your cells aren't going to have energy. You're going to be in lactic acidosis. Your cells are going to starve. And, uh, you know, a, another factor... Uh, you know, in recent data that I saw is that cholesterol, which is part of the cell membrane, that cholesterol in the cell membrane is responsible for getting carbon dioxide out of the cell into the bloodstream to attach to hemoglobin to go out the lungs. So what I'm saying, and this is in the literature because statins do reduce membrane cholesterol, especially in the brain, that if you if you are taking a statin drug, you are now becoming deficient at a cellular level of cholesterol. Therefore, you cannot move carbon dioxide out of your system. You understand? I know you understand, but for the listeners, how fundamental that is. If you cannot get the cellular waste of carbon dioxide out of the cells, and now the cells become acidotic, you know that's 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 a recipe for disaster. And I think we see this uh, on a daily basis. Let me. I'm going to go one deeper here. What What's your opinion on cholesterol as a whole? So many people, you know, you you watch TV, you see the commercials, you know, eat your Honey Nut Cheerios to lower your cholesterol. Everybody's just like so hyper focused on trying to lower cholesterol. Can you Can you give us the Dr. Jack Wolfson breakdown on on what your opinion of of aggressively lowering cholesterol is, or is cholesterol even really all that big of a risk factor? Yeah, sure thing. I mean, for everyone who's listening, you know, to this summit, you know, quite frankly, I, if I say the word cholesterol, what do you think of? What does that conjure up in your brain when someone says cholesterol? Well, when I speak all over, I often pose that same question. People raise their hands. Well, I think heart attack. I think, you know, cheesy, uh, you know, plaque in the arteries. You know, I think blockages. I, I think about some, uh, I think about eggs. You know, uh, cholesterol is a very, very important life-sustaining molecule in all animal species, and that's why it's inside of an egg. That is why it is inside of a human breast milk and all mammals' breast milk, because we cannot raise a chicken on oatmeal. It has to be cholesterol-containing yolk. But it was vilified years ago for a variety of reasons that is well spelled out in the literature, in my book and in other books, and... Uh, it's all pharmaceutical speak. It's all pharmaceutical speak to tell us uh, that this thing is bad and now we got to take a drug to, to make it lower. And uh, society has suffered for it over the last 
60 years. But cholesterol is our friend. Cholesterol consumption actually in food raises HDL particle numbers, uh, which is which is very very important. Uh, cholesterol consumption in food can also raise LDL, but it, it once again it's that balance of the LDL to HDL that really uh, what matters, and it doesn't do anything to worsen the ratio. In fact, it improves the ratio. So cholesterol is our friend. Uh, enjoy it when it comes from uh, quality pasture raised. Uh, uh, formulations, all those women out there, make sure you breastfeed so you can crank up cholesterol levels into your baby's brains. Uh, yeah, I, I love that you said that because I think so many people fight fight that one. They, they they fight it not because it's necessarily true, but because it's just been driven into them so hard. Um, and and hearing it from a cardiologist, I think, goes a long way. Let's, yeah, and obviously, you know, I mean, Dr. Peter, I mean, real quick, I mean, it's like I, I came from the other side. I practiced in the conventional cardiology model, you know, for, you know, for, for, for many years, including your know, training, I mean, well over 10 years. So I know everything the conventional cardiologist knows, and I know the holistic side. And, you know, I choose to practice over on this side uh, whenever possible. I mean, clearly there's a situation, you know, I'm not saying if, you know, if you're in the midst of a heart attack, you know, chew on a cayenne pepper, although I do think it'll work. I'm not saying if you're in the midst of a, a heart attack, go see your chiropractor for an adjustment, although I do think you should. Um, at least on your way to the emergency room, maybe stop and get an adjustment first. You know, uh, Dr. Peter, I've often said that'd be so amazing to have a chiropractor in the emergency room, like as if, you know, one of the chiropractors would want to sit there. But to have a chiropractor in the emergency room, and a person comes in, 9 out of 10 chest pain patients are musculoskeletal. So first of all, you'll get rid of all those patients out of the ER, make them feel better immediately without spending billions of dollars in wasted resources. But then also, if you are in the midst of an actual myocardial infarction, a heart attack, and you do get a chiropractic adjustment, and you do increase parasympathetic tone, you may open up that blood vessel that is under sympathetic dominance and therefore constricted. Now you can open up the blood vessel and let the blood flow. I think it's a, I think it's a great study. I'd love to pilot it with somebody. If anybody's out there listening, count me in. Well, I had it. You know, it's interesting you say that. I had a, I had a chiropractor friend in New York, and he was actually working in the ER. And what's one of the things they did, he had such a good relationship with the hospital, is that all the people that thought they were having heart attacks, he would get first crack at them. And a lot of them were actually having pseudo heart attacks, right? They were having a musculoskeletal attack. They might, some of them were having intercostal con, con, costochondritis, you know, things that would potentially make them think they were having a heart attack that were musculoskeletal in nature. And, you know, I think he still works there. As a matter of fact, to this day, I'll have to connect you. Staffing an emergency room with, uh, you know, a, a holistic doctor and certainly a doctor of chiropractic, adjusting these people that come in with chest pain and other aches and pains. Uh, I mean, it is revolutionary and would honestly it would save the country hundreds of billions of dollars. But uh, you know, you know, we'll just reserve that for a little dream. I'm glad to hear about your friend. I think it's a great model, and I loved. I would love to be involved. Uh, you know, with anything uh, like that. Let's let's talk a little bit next about, I wanted to talk about blood pressure. You know, oh, that's another really super common condition that people, you know, that, that, that people I think have kind of the wrong story and the wrong, the, the wrong advice on. And there are a number of different types of medications that, that actually, you know, designed to lower blood pressure. Can you talk a little bit about in your experience, what are, what are some of the most important and critical things that people need to do if, they're, if their blood pressure is high? And I'm not talking about the obvious overweight person who goes to the buffet and eats a salty meal every day. I'm talking about somebody who maybe has high blood pressure and their regular weight and they try to exercise, but their blood pressure is still a problem. Can you walk us through a scenario where, that, where you might have some advice for that individual? Yeah, most certainly. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, there are some strange oddball diagnoses that are like, you know, one in a hundred thousand, one in a million that could lead to high blood pressure that need to be medically taken care of. But let's just talk about the, you know, 99.999% of everybody else that has high blood pressure because they lack sunshine exposure. Our ancestors were in the sun all day long, in and out of the sun, and they were running around naked. So I'll ask you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Listener, when is the last time you were out running around in the sun naked, going to sleep with the sun down, awaking with the sunrise, staying out of the artificial light? That behavior, when you're not in congruence with nature, raises blood pressure. Stress raises blood pressure. Pain raises blood pressure. 
Um, lack of physical activity, as you said. Uh, sleep apnea is something that everybody should get tested for if you think you may have uh, have it. You know, ask your partner or take a survey. You know, if you think that's a factor. Uh, chiropractic care has proven to lower blood pressure 17 over 10 points. So if you have high blood pressure, uh, you likely have subluxations like everybody else who doesn't get adjusted. So you better get into your chiropractor and get adjusted, especially that cervical adjustment and the thoracic adjustment. But certainly everything, every of course every every uh, you know uh, the brain is connected, every part of the body, and every part of the body is connected back to the brain. So that's certainly very important. Um, but those are the strategies. And then, of course, from a, uh, like a nutritional and a food standpoint, I'm a huge fan of organic beetroot powder. I'm a huge fan of things that boost up nitric oxide, cranking up levels of magnesium, cranking up levels of potassium. All those things are all uh, important factors to, uh, to all things health and wellness and certainly appropriate control of, of blood pressure. Love it. Thanks for that, for that synopsis. <laughs> Do you have any kind of, you know, we're going to wrap this up. Do you have any pearls of wisdom, things that we didn't really, that I didn't ask you about or things that you really feel like the audience could walk away with today and implement and it could help them in in the realm of heart disease and the realm of autoimmune disease? We hear, you know, that, uh, you know, I can't afford to live that lifestyle. I can't afford to eat those foods. I can't afford those behaviors. Well, first of all, you can't afford not to. And I would tell people, listen, stop drinking Starbucks. Stop getting your nails done. Stop getting your hair done. Um, you know, stop taking trips or buying new cars or, uh, you know, whatever it may be. Don't get a new cell phone every six months. You know, take care of yourself. But, uh, you know, uh, when it comes, listen, sunshine is free. You know, move out to Arizona where it's sunny 450 days a year. Sunshine is free. Sleeping with the sun down is free. And then, of course, uh, you know, and the other thing, too, I want to tell people when it comes to diet, don't forget about the spices because the pharmaceuticals came from the spice industry. So make sure that when you're eating your pasture-raised eggs for breakfast, have it with a, uh, a half of an avocado. But inside of those eggs, rosemary, thyme, oregano, cumin, turmeric, uh, bay leaves, marjoram, uh, they're all nature's pharmaceuticals. Enjoy them. Excellent. Thank you so much. So where can people go? It's the doctorswolfson.com. That's D-R-S-W-O-L-F-S-O-N, the doctorswolfson.com. And then your book, The Paleo Cardiologist, is that it's available on Amazon? Yes. Yeah, the book is available on Amazon. Listen, Amazon has enough money. I would appreciate it if you came to the website or to the Paleo Cardiologist. Um, and then, of course, if you... Paleo just for you and also for someone that you love you know get the, uh, what better gift than the gift of health that means so much more uh, than you know than a new sweater or a box of chocolate or a or a gift card to uh, you know to target uh, give somebody the gift of, of health and wellness our website is the doctors wolfson doctors is drs wolfson w o l f s o n and then stay tuned we're also on social media at the doctors wolfson and stay tuned for my new podcast coming out the healthy heart show all right, the Healthy Heart Show. Love it. Well, Dr. Wolfson, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate you taking the time and appreciate you again, all the courage and the bravery you've had to step forward against the proverbial grain, so to speak, and uh, and speak the truth to help people get better. Thank you. Uh, you got it, my friend. Great to talk to you. Thank you, and thank you all. God bless. God bless. Have a great day. 